Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Karen Galarno, and I will be guiding us through today's event. We'd like to cover just a few housekeeping items before we begin. We are offering American Sign Language Interpreting and closed captioning for today's forum. To access the American Sign Language Interpreters, you'll need to look for their thumbnail and then pin it. They are listed as ASL Interpreter and their names. To access closed captioning, you should look at the bottom right corner of your screen and there's a multimedia box. You'll want to click on that. You will then see the closed captioning start. You can select the language, font size, and color that best suits your viewing. This forum is being recorded and will be posted on the OPWDD website on the strategic planning pages. We will start today with an introduction from Commissioner Kastner, and then we will turn it over to the Regional Director for Central New York. Once the Regional Director finishes their presentation, which should take about 15 minutes, we will turn it over to the people who have signed up to provide their verbal feedback on the questions that were provided on the invitation. We will not be responding to any questions asked at this time to ensure that we have enough time for everyone that signed up to speak. If you do have questions that you need answered, please email them to info at opwdd.ny.gov. I'd like to now turn the program over to Commissioner Kastner. Commissioner? Thanks, Karen. Well, good morning and welcome to OPWDD's virtual regional public forum in support of our comprehensive five-year planning. This is the second of our five separate forums we're holding around the state to hear from the people we support and their family members. We want to hear your ideas and suggestions for setting OPWDD's strategic priorities for the future. And we also want to hear your ideas about how we can best use the funds from the American Rescue Plan to support home and community-based services. So thank you for participating today, and we look forward to hearing what you say. After all the forums are complete, we will continue talking about these things with the people who are impacted most by our service system. We will continue to meet with stakeholder groups around the state and gather their ideas as well. We've also set up a planning email address, as you've heard, at planning, I'm sorry, planning at opwdd.ny.gov, where you can send us your thoughts and suggestions. Anyone is welcome to submit their comments using this email address. We'll gather all the input from the spring and summer forums and then use it to develop our five-year comprehensive plan, what we call the 507 plan named for the section of mental hygiene law that requires it. This plan will be our roadmap guiding our agency's activities and initiatives moving forwards. So again, thank you for joining us in this important work. Your voice matters and we're excited to listen to you. Now I'll turn the forum over to our regional director, Anne-Marie Peterson, and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Hi, everyone. My name is Anne-Marie Peterson, and many of you may already know me, but for those who do not, I am the regional director for this OPWDD region, which includes the 20 counties within the Broom, Central New York, and some mountain districts of Region 2. As many of you know, our regional offices are typically the first place people go when they access services throughout OPWDD, and the place they continue to come back to as their needs change throughout their lifetime. I want you to know how important it is to us for you to take part in this process to ensure that we are providing quality supports that you need and want and create equitable, accessible, and sustainable supports for the future. We need your feedback to help guide us. The people we support and the families who also support them are the most critical and important part of our service system. 
This system was built for you and by you. And we want to continue to ensure that we can keep meeting your needs with your guidance. The way we usually get this opportunity to hear from you is through our regular public committee meetings that are advertised on our website, our social media pages, and through our mailing list. But today we're here to launch another way for you to provide feedback. The New York Mental Hygiene Law requires that OPWDD, along with our sister agencies, the Office of Mental Health and the Office of Addiction and Substance Abuse Services, develop a five-year comprehensive plan, which is then reviewed annually. We know OPWDD hasn't updated our 507 strategic plan for a few years, which is why we are here to correct that oversight. We know that many of you, as well as our own staff, look to the 507 plan as a guide for our future. It helps us set a path and expectations that we can all understand and follow. The fact is, the 507 planning engages all of you in the process, and that's exactly what we've been missing out on. That's why this process and this engagement is incredibly important. It gives everyone a chance to have a voice. The purpose of the 507 planning process is to determine the service system vision and goals over the next five years and how to achieve those goals. Within that five-year term, there are separate annual goals that we hope to achieve. Those annual goals are updated every year and is, which is the reason the 507 strategic plan is expected to be updated and released every year. Everything we do and every decision we make is built around OPWDD's vision that people with developmental disabilities should be afforded the opportunity to enjoy meaningful relationships with friends, families, and others in their lives, experience personal health and growth, and live in the home of their choice and fully participate in their communities. We include this slide as an important reminder to all of us of our mutual purpose as we begin the planning process for the years 2021 through 2026. Entering this planning cycle, OPWD has set specific goals we would like to meet the overarching themes behind our planning. These include sustainability, that all eligible people will receive supports that they can continue to be maintained well into the future. Equity, that all eligible people will receive supports based on their specific needs is determined using a fair and consistent process all across the state. And accessibility, that all eligible people will be able to access flexible services and supports that change as a person's needs change, and that those options will be explained in their language of choice. We also want to ensure that we are meeting these goals while providing services in the most integrated setting possible for each person. The challenges presented by the COVID-19 public health emergency are still impacting us all. Our direct support workforce and the service providers worked hard through the past year to keep people safe. Many people were isolated from family and friends. Students with disabilities struggled to participate in remote learning. Family caregivers struggled to meet the needs of their loved ones without their usual daily routines and support. As we are emerging from COVID-19, there remain some very real challenges, workforce shortages, which we were already a concern prior to COVID, are even more critical. Prior to COVID, we were already experiencing significant growth in spending on many of our supports and services at rates higher than increases to annual funding. A spending increase of about 6% annually per person per year in group homes were seen on average, while the number of people receiving those services grew less than 1% each year. A 5% growth annually on day habilitation um, spending with less than 1% growth per year in people receiving the services. Supportive employment spending per person grew on an average of 8% while the number of people using the service remained the same. Agency-sponsored respite 
spending grew by over 13% annually, with only 2% growth in the number of people receiving the service. Self-direction spending remained the same per person. However, the number of people who participated in self-direction grew on average of nearly 36% year over year. As we enter a new post-COVID environment, we need to resolve the significant growth in spending we were already experiencing prior to the pandemic and look at ways which we can provide support to more people more efficiently. There are opportunities despite these challenges. COVID-19 has shown us that technology can help us improve services. We have seen increases in the use of telehealth technology to help residential staff consult with medical staff about the health of residents, cutting down on unnecessary and risky emergency room visits. We have used technology to connect people and help people continue building skills when in-person services can't happen. Cooperative programs such as the one run by Capital Regions BOCES are examples of how we can begin to address workforce shortage. New direct support professionals training programs at BOCES, in conjunction with the New York Alliance for Inclusion and Innovation, gives low-income people who are unemployed or underemployed training through BOCES to become DSPs. Capital Region BOCES has also established a two-year program where students can learn skills with the goal of becoming direct support professionals during the final two years of high school. In addition, federal funding being provided under the American Rescue Plan gives us additional opportunities to address some of the challenges we face. The federal government implemented the American Rescue Plan in 2021 which set aside funding for more home and community-based services through the Medicaid Federal Medical Assistance Percentage Funding, otherwise known as FMAP. This is being delivered in the form of a 10% one-time rise in federal government share of spending on the Medicaid program starting April 2021 and extending through March 2022. The goal of the program is to enhance, expand, or strengthen home and community-based services the rescue plan will provide one-time, short-term funding with a three-year window for the use of the funds. We are seeking your feedback to determine how the funding can best be used to help support people. Our initial plan is due to the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services in mid-June 2021. These forums are our initial opportunity to hear from you, and there will be additional opportunities after we submit the initial plan. Throughout the spring and summer, there will also be many opportunities for you to provide input to OPWD's strategic plan. Input can be provided through the mail or through our new email address, which is planning at opwdd.ny.gov. These regional forums are just the starting point of the process. There also will be many sessions with organized stakeholders and groups throughout the summer. Additionally, once we have a draft plan put together, there will be another organized effort to hear feedback on the draft plan in the fall of 2021. In the invitation we sent out to invite you to these meetings, we included several questions regarding areas where we were looking for feedback. Those questions were not meant to limit you. They were meant to get the thought process started. The following slides will go through those areas a little bit further to help you understand where we are and where we need input from you moving forward to make sure your interests and concerns are taken into account. OPWDD serves people throughout their lifespan, from very young children who live at home with their families and who are primarily provided supports from their local schools, receiving only minimal services through OPWDD, to older adults who need supports across every area of their life, including housing. At all stages of people's lives, we want to provide the right level of support so that people can leave, live meaningful lives as independently as possible, 
as we meet the ever-growing demand for new services. As people age, their needs and interests change, and the focuses of services must change also. Therefore, our strategic plan must take into account the need to support families in the development of skills for children, promote independence, and support meaningful activities in the community and employment for adults, and provide appropriate services as people age, such as increased support needs, retirement, and late life changes. Helping people live as independently as possible while providing access to supports they need to meet their goals is the basis for OPWDD's housing plans. A variety of housing supports currently range from housing subsidies that gives options for independent living in settings offering different levels of support and supervision, such as smaller community group homes and much larger congregate settings. OPWDD supports approximately 38,000 people in residential settings, and an average of 1,200 new people move into OPWD residential settings every year. The OPWD housing subsidies is authorized for over 6,000 people statewide. A self-direction model with shared living, environmental modifications, and assistive technologies is available for people to help maintain independence. Our goal is to continue to grow these existing opportunities while looking at how we can better support people with complex, challenging needs. Not-for-profit not provider agencies are critical partners, providing approximately 80% of OPWD's housing. 20% is operated by OPWDD. We continue to develop additional residential opportunities by issuing requests for proposals from provider organizations. The most recent RFP was issued in 2020 and awards for projects are occurring. There is a current activity which we have nicknamed FLOW that invites people in state-operated homes who have less challenging needs to consider a new living opportunity with a voluntary provider which would in turn create an opening for state-operated services for people ready to leave residential schools who have more complex needs. The 507 strategic plan will take into account these and other ideas in planning sustainable housing supports for the future. The COVID-19 public health emergency has shown us that day services need to be more flexible and better meet the needs of people we serve. While not many people found telehealth to be a good alternative, it also did not work for many people as well. Below are a few of our findings in this area for consideration as we plan for the future of services. Person-centered planning must be done for each person to determine whether teleservices or in-resident supports will better meet the needs. A balanced combination of services that can support a person within their home or within their community would be the goal. Transportation can be a barrier to services and employment, so solutions must be sought. Vocational and social skills should be a component in all day services. The day habilitation structure could be more beneficial if we were more individualized, more focused on skills for independence, and took place in smaller groups within the community. In building the 507 plan, we also need to look at how we ensure that employment is the first option for people who want it, and how we can better prepare people for employment. To incentivize hiring, OPWD has offered a back-to-work incentive to pay wages for short term under a condition that the employer, age, the employer agrees to hire after the time period is over. We need to look at other ways that might incentivize employers to hire people. Positions may need to be customized to offer employment opportunities for people of all abilities. To create an employment path for people to follow, all day service providers could be encouraged to offer the community pre-vocational service option so that people in day habilitation could move on to pre-vocational services or pathways to employment to gain employment skills and then on to employment. Employment staff need to be trained not only 
to assist the person receiving services, but also negotiate with work and businesses on hiring. These are just a few examples of how employment programs could be improved upon moving forward. Self-direction offers the most flexibility and control over a person's services as possible. Self-direction is intended as a choice for anyone who is able to make their own decisions about their services or has chosen another trusted adult to help them. OPWDD is currently working on enhancing training and communication for support brokers, fiscal intermediaries, care managers, and support staff so that people have professional help available to help them self-direct. The, the new 507 plan should take into account how we can improve upon these services even further. We have seen a lot of growth in the number of young children and their families looking for cross-system and residential supports over the last few years. This growth shows a need to grow community-based supports to make sure that children and their families are able to, to get the help they need, including the ability to support those children who are in crisis so that they can remain with their families. Future planning should take into account the need to provide adult placement services for children leaving residential schools. Telehealth became a life-saving support throughout COVID-19's public health emergency. At this time, there is work around extending the support beyond health emergency and making it a more permanent support. And there are ongoing talks around policy and regulation changes that might be needed. OPWD is also looking at the use of clinical services across disability types to see where changes should be made to match need and demand. Making sure services are available to meet identified clinical needs is critical. OPWDD is also working with state and local mental health um, and hygiene partners to identify gaps in access to, cri to crisis supports and services and problem solve strategies to help fill those gaps. We anticipate this being a large part of future planning. The flow initiative mentioned earlier is one strategy we are currently using to make space available to serve people with more complex needs and provide choice to ensure people are living in the most integrated settings, to make the use of current vacancies, and to open opportunities in state-operated homes for people who have aged out of residential schools and are awaiting adult services opportunities. State-operated residents can provide highly specialized services for people with complex needs. These are areas we anticipate to play, play a significant role in our strategic planning process. As care coordination organization health homes have been operating for almost three full years now, and many of the early challenges in developing new organizations have been overcome, we now need to turn our attention to enhancing the quality of care management services. We want to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the health home model in helping people of all need levels to learn how we can improve going forward. We want to look at this particularly for people with complex needs and those who live outside of congregate settings. Care management was established to improve the coordination and integration of services across multiple systems, including health, behavioral health, and developmental services to help people stay healthy and avoid the need for crisis and emergency health care and to establish ongoing supports timely. Over the next several years, we want to increase the care manager's ability to serve people with complex needs and better integrate care across multiple systems to focus on the whole person, not just the developmental disability services. As demand for services grow, so does our need to attract and retain qualified workforce. OPWD is partnering with providers and services and other organizations to begin to build recruitment opportunities at the high school level and among non-traditional adult students. We have developed training opportunities in partnership with SUNY and are looking at additional ways to build staff retention. 
OPWG is supporting the regional centers for workforce transformation to build competency, enhance training, and provide technical assistance. We need to increase recruitment efforts for clinical staff to provide important and much needed behavioral nursing and dental services. Innovations in technology and housing will not only increase independence for people we support, but will help us maximize our workforce during the ongoing shortage. Data collection is also a part of an ongoing effort to allow for targeted workforce strategies. These and other opportunities to strengthen our workforce will be crucial to the future sustainability of the system and will pay, play a major role in the 507 plan. Now that we've set the stage sharing OPWD's goals for moving forward, some of the challenges we face and some of the opportunities we have available, we want to hear from you and get your feedback on your vision for the five-year plan and what topics areas are important to you. Your feedback will help guide us as we begin drafting the five-year plan next month. As you know, we are hosting five public forums and also attending meetings like this one with different advocacy groups where we will also get their feedback on the five-year plan. We will also hear feedback at our regular public meeting groups like the Developmental Disability Advisory Council, the Family Support Services Planning Council, and by meeting with numerous other representative organizations. Overall, we have about 30 additional opportunities to hear from others who are not able to attend at these forums. If you have not already, I invite you to check out our new strategic planning page on the OPWDD website. You can get there by looking under About Us in the folder, in the footer. If you find information related to the planning process, current initiatives, and links to data, this page will be updated throughout the planning process as new information is available. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen Galarno so we can start hearing from the people who have signed up to speak at the forum. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie. We are now at the part of the program where you all do the talking. I'm going to read your names off one by one. As I read your name, please unmute your microphone so that we can hear you and begin speaking. You will have three minutes. To help us keep on time and ensure we hear all of our speakers, you'll see a, a three-minute timer on your screen. And as a reminder, if you haven't already, please feel free to share your written remarks with your regional contact. And your full remarks will be considered. So we'll turn to the first speaker, Sally Coletti. Can you please unmute your mic? Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so first and foremost, I want to say that I'm a mother. I'm a mother to a 27 year old son with autism, atypical autism. He has forged my way rather than the reverse. And hence, I have been a broker since the onset of the program in 2004. Let me say that again. I've been a broker since 2004. My son was one of the first three children in New York State to be part of that program as well. So since that time, I have written over 400 self-direction plans across New York State and every single county. 62 counties with a little used Saturn station wagon. I pride myself on the fact that I work, the work I do is not only for my son, but for the impact that I've made on those other families and they on me. So I'll continue to be a broker and I also serve on the Human Rights Council and I'll continue to do that for quite some time. I also work as a regional lead and I like to kind of disclose this. I work as a regional lead in the world of DSRIP, D-S-R-I-P, and the work of the MRT. Um, so many of the, uh, much of the infrastructure you discuss in this area, you know that we've had, uh, we, we've had a hand in. My recommendations are more in line with what we need to fix with the self-direction program. 
Um, it's it's emphatic that this program remains for my son. Um, one thing that we really need to work on um, is that where the location of services are provided. Uh, it should be allowed that all services that a person has, they choose where they occur. So some staff have sisters and brothers who have their own houses. Let them go over there and continue to get their services there. Around the community, wherever it may be, let them receive those services there. But speaking of locations, I have testified every year in every every realm that I can since 2004 on this issue, and I'm going to read this. I've even spoken with Donna Frescatori, our Medicaid director on this, who agrees. And that is, in accordance with 42 CFR, waiver services are not furnished to individuals who are inpatients in a hospital, nursing facility, or an ID. Therefore, it is not a double billing issue when a ComHab staff goes and accompanies somebody who is an inpatient on day two, three, et cetera. It's vital that somebody important, somebody, somebody known to this person sits with them. Hospitals have sitters. That is not the same thing. Those sitters are meant for people who come out of, out of the jails and who are, or who are on suicide watch. Those sitters do not help our children when they're hospitalized. Families have to leave jobs and they and they are dismissed from their jobs for the time that they spend. Group homes sometimes absorb this cost, sometimes not. Hospital staff have to, to deal with it and it's it's just not, it doesn't work. So let's undo that regulation. Donna said that she would speak to Commissioner Kastner. Commissioner Kastner, I ask that you connect with Donna Frescatori and let's fix that one little regulation that just keeps staying in the place. It's it's not it's not a real regulation. It's it's a misunderstanding. I'll submit the rest of everything that I've written about being a broker, what we need to do, CAS systems, all of that. Everybody else is going to probably talk about um, in writing. Okay, you can also look back at what I testified on for Senator Carlucci's uh, committee last year on the impact of COVID of those with developmental disabilities, and my my statements are in writing. In that. Thank you everyone for participating. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you for starting the, the program off. Appreciate that. And our next speaker is Kathleen Marafino. Kathleen. Good morning. Hi, I'm morning. speaking. I'm speaking as a parent, a support broker for 20 years and an advocate of many decades. I'm the 76 year old mother of a 42 year old son who's always lived at home with me. He started in self direction in 2001, then known as CSS. Through his participation in self direction, he has expanded his horizons, pursued new interests such as art and music, connected to his community, and made lasting friendships. Perhaps most importantly, Rick X interacts positively with other people and with his environment. As a result of SD services, Rick is generally perceived as a capable, compassionate, mild-mannered person who contributes positively his, to his community. To maintain that status, he needs to receive supports based upon his individual needs and choices provided with care and respect. Rick feels safe and secure with his self-hired staff and the opportunities that SD offers him. We know what works best for Rick because we didn't have it for 21 years through the school system. SD has been 180 degrees different from those earlier experiences. Years of negativity, suspensions, lack of curriculum, punitive actions, due process, behaviors precipitated by the school district that were transferred to home. Thankfully, those things are no longer part of our life and Rick was resilient enough to survive that and move on to life as a valued member of the community. So what we've learned from our positive experience with SD is that we need a system of self-direction in the state that is open to all individuals who choose it, that measures up to the principles of self-direction determination and in which person-centeredness is given more than lip service. Individuals who have 24 seven complex needs should have a right to the full array of SD services. In addition, it's imperative that New York retain the definition of ComHab that is part of the current waiver. A more restrictive definition and thereby more limited access to ComHab will undermine the successes that my son and others have achieved. We know that SD is more cost effective than traditional services. Obviously, it's made it possible for Rick to remain in his family for longer than would otherwise have been possible. We also know that SD must be funded in a manner that realistically reflects the needs of each person. What we need going forward is sustainability for families. 
Now we are approaching a new juncture. As an elderly parent, my son will need to find within the self-direction world a place of his own to live and continue to thrive. He's a person who needs 24-7 supports. Without the support of people who respect him, support his preferred method of communication and see him as a valuable human, he's at risk of regression and of facing previously experienced challenges. Our goal is to ensure that Rick will be able to design a sustainable self-directed plan where he's appropriately supported when I'm no longer able to do that. We need a new version of self-directed services that can provide non-certified residential services to people like Rick who no longer have their families. We don't want IRA services, although he could qualify for one. We want non-congregate residential opportunity that allows him to maintain his current quality of life. Perhaps FPAP FMAP funding could be used to pilot such a model of services. The pandemic experiences support the need for individualized services in non-congregate settings. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And we'll go to Lisa Cyber. Lisa, if you can unmute. Please. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I uh, I live in the southern tier, so I keep you you guys keep coming in and out because the service here is not the best. So hopefully, um, you guys can hear me okay. Um, yep. I, I want to. Okay, great. Um, I want to first thank everybody uh, for putting this together, and um, I guess I'm going to address a lot of things that Miss Peterson. Uh, had mentioned that you guys are going to be working on and uh, realize that, which I am so, so thrilled about. Um, I am a mother of a 23 year old uh, daughter with autism. I live in a two family house, so I'm lucky enough to have her above me so I can, you know, help her um, as needed. Um, what I wanted to focus on is the topic of how can OPWDD include the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout the service system. Um, what I feel uh, about that is that that's what we should be doing. And when you look at, and I'm a little new with all of this, because unfortunately, as Ms. Peterson mentions, uh, com uh, complex needs of the individual, it took me many, many years until she finally saw um, the psychiatrist. We were originally in Suffolk County in person and within 10 minutes, um, the meeting was concluded and she was approved on the spot. So I've had a lot of uh, issues with uh, complications, getting services and also with people not uh, knowing their jobs. Uh, so I've kind of been through the ringer and I think that definitely having uh, people uh, that service us know their jobs thoroughly will be a big help. But I, I just think that the IDGS and the uh, OTPS need to be more individualized. These are, as I understand it, and I'm always told, no, this, this is, you know, you have certain things set up, but meanwhile, regions are so different, you know, like, like take e even uh, as indicated in this form, New York state alone is divided into four regions and broken up even further within these regions. Even the local weather forecast in the, uh, in my area breaks it down by central New York, North County and Southern tier. I think that, you know, you, you have scat buses and buses uh, at a nominal rate that pick uh, children up when I was in Suffolk County and young adults and bring them to jobs, but yet up here we don't have that service, but yet transportation is treated the same throughout uh, New York State as a whole. Um, I think also having parents maybe on the panel to get their insight, not just here, but at the planning stage, if you can get a panel of volunteers and these parents um, you know, maybe, you know, with all different um, throughout the spectrum, you know, whether my daughter has uh, autism, uh, somebody else has Tourette's, like all different. So you get uh, a knowledge of their needs. My daughter is high functioning in a lot of areas, but in a lot of areas, she's not. She has this budget 
she can't really use almost $40,000 in this budget because of how it's structured. So, you know, my feeling is OPWDD is supposed to be for individuals with disability. Let's start working on that. I don't know how things came up, but you have, you, you pay for, for uh, a dog training for, for a companion dog, but that's it. I, I don't know how these things came about, but a lot of them don't make sense, at least to me. I don't know about anybody else, but you have a companion dog, you're allowed to have a companion dog, they'll pay for training, but that's it. Maybe put a limit, 3,000 or companion dog has to be from a shelter, which my daughter's dog is. That would help our communities clear out the shelters too. You know, I don't know. I'm just saying that there's a lot of very strange um, things with this, mm -hmm. um, with the funds, and it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be individualized. Thank you. <laughs> Thank I'm you very much. And I'm new with all this. Sorry, guys. Thank you very much. And we'll go to our next speaker, Pat Slasky. Good morning. Uh, on behalf of my daughter, Darcy, and myself, we wish to thank you for this opportunity. Um, in the time allocated, we have one focus area that we'd like to comment on, and that's based on our past experience and future planning as we speak. Uh, and that's the housing shortage for persons with IDDD and their aging parents. Um, background that uh, Darcy was a happy, healthy um, individual in school, um, entered an IRA um, out of school. Um, first six years were wonderful and then changes staffing and management. We find that her needs were not being met, um, applied for self-direction and were approved and we couldn't be happier. Um, as we delve into this, uh, this whole arena of housing, um, we're at the the stage where the husband is failing and the primary caregiver myself approaching 74 years of age it's now become um, just not something to look at and explore it's really more that it's imperative that we seek housing um, for Darcy where she can be valued and remain happy healthy and safe so in order to do that um, we jumped into this arena three years ago through the state's opportunities with uh, resource manuals and webinars and, and series of conferences we did did meet roadblocks and namely uh, finding um, housemates that would make this affordable and feasible um, the other question was how meds would be dispensed were she to be living in a home of her own. Um, affordable and accessible wheelchair um, apartment or facility. Um, aspects uh, financially and sustainability were two key components that are daunting and as, as everyone probably finds this. And coming to the realization that we really needed to enlist uh, services of a housing navigator. Um, which I did try again three years ago, was not available because of the differences in the FR. Um, we're on the road. We did meet a master housing navigator who um, has given us insight, expertise, direction, and that's what we needed. Um, and hope, that's the one thing that keeps us going to plan for her future. But to make her dream of a home of her own a reality, um, we ask that several things be taken into consideration. Showcase top successful housing projects, for example, uh, Springbrook. Enlist corporate sponsorships in assisting with the endeavor. Continue your webinars near Alliance statewide regional housing collaboratives. Recruit, train, and use housing and navigators. Distribute a regional list of those interested in sharing housing alternatives. Ensuring that persons with IDDD require 24-7 are not left behind and allowed the same opportunities of those who are more independent. Since staffing is key, please, 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 we need to pay them commiserate with the program and with the job that they do, continue staff appreciation, allow staff to be paid uh, appropriately, um, finding them, and then the training. Training of staff is key, um, preventing high turnover, and then implement changes, please, to the nurse Practice Act, Delegation of Nursing Tests to DSPs. Lastly, to incorporate technology, provide healthy, happy daily living, streamline paperwork, work collaboratively, communicates, and 
pure enjoyment. So this is it, and those are my ideas, and I thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and next we'll move to Jackie Sauter. Jackie, if you can unmute your mic, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jackie Sauter. I live in Canton, New York. My husband and I are parents and guardians of our son, Stephen, who just turned 36, has Down syndrome, and currently lives at home with us. I've always been proud and glad we lived in the state of New York where supports and services that my son needed were mostly available. I've always had the sense that the state cared about my son and his life, about all people with disabilities. I'm sad to say I no longer feel that way. In recent years, people with IDD and their families feel they've been disregarded. Programs and services that our loved ones depend on to live safe and happy lives have been under attack. Most troubling of all is that where once OPWDD led the way, it now seems to be the Department of Health and the Office of Budget that are calling the shots, and no one in state leadership seems to be thinking about what's best for our loved ones, and many families are frightened about the future. But with the creation of a new statewide comprehensive five-year plan and with the availability of additional FMAP funds from the American Rescue Plan, OPWDD has a watershed opportunity to once again be a meaningful advocate for our loved ones. These are some critical issues and priorities that must be addressed in the plan. One, the staffing crisis. The failure of the state to provide a living wage for direct support professionals is unacceptable. Despite a decade of effort, wages remain shamefully low. As a result, providers cannot find enough workers, putting vulnerable people at risk and causing programs to shut down. OPWDD must urgently prioritize and allocate funds to pay a fair wage to DSPs. Two, stagnation in developing appropriate residential opportunities is limiting options for many, and as parents age, this will become a crisis. OPWDD must work with families and providers to expand residential options of all types that are person-centered, community-based, and supported. Three, providers are being pushed to the edge of their existence. New regulations and rate adjustments are increasingly burdensome, making the work these essential organizations do ever more difficult. OPWDD must support providers in the work to develop and maintain person-centered residential and community-based programs and opportunities. Four, we are continually faced with cuts and threats of cuts to the Family Support Services Program, the Self-Direction Program, the Community Habilitation Program, the Care Coordination Organizations, and so on. The constant assault on all these services undermines stability, limits opportunity, and upends people's lives. OPWDD must recommit to these essential services. Our system is in crisis. I urge you to work to restore the state of New York as a champion for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, our most vulnerable citizens. As parents and advocates, we and those we love and care for are expecting nothing less. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Linda Montemoro. I apologize if I said that incorrectly. Montemoro? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today to speak on behalf of my son. He is eight years old. He is uh, profoundly deaf and severely autistic. I think I'm following up with kind of what Lisa was speaking about and uh, how strict the budget is and how uh, he has self-direction and it is very challenging to get uh, any of his needs met through the budget as far as purchasing items for sensory or for safety. We have been in self-direction for quite a while and we really have not been that pleased with how we're able to use it. Haven't really been able to find any respite workers to use the respite portion. Um, and as I, I think about my son, my son is someone who we spend a lot of time 
concerned for safety and for um, meeting his sensory needs. He's very sensory seeking and he's very, um, very, very active. So we just need to meet his sensory needs and his safety needs. I think that we talk about inclusion, we talk about diversity, and we talk about person-centered. And I don't think sometimes all of these things can, all of these things can be met at the same time. Because when you have a child like my son, Alex, who really needs, let's say a swing outside, he like, he's outside year round, upstate New York, winter, maybe we shorten his time outside because it's cold, but he is outside. So self-direction budget won't pay for it because it's seasonal. I mean, that's terrible because his need is not going to get met through the budget because of the strict, it's seasonal. The other thing is, is he is so sensory seeking, he eats a lot of things. So when he, if we were to sign him up for a class, an inclusive class, he literally maybe would sit there and eat paint and, and Play-Doh and whatever, maybe if it's an art class. Um, that's not really, it's not really suitable for him, but maybe a, a individual teacher who may be able to provide him with some meeting some of his sensory needs with some very um, edible types of artwork that would suit him, but that would be individual to his need. That wouldn't be covered in the budget. Um, and lastly, I'd like to talk a little bit about too about the classes. So the, the class, he wouldn't be able, he could maybe take a swimming class, but yet again, the budget maybe wouldn't cover a pool or a sprinkle or some sort of water fund because that is seasonal. So I'm going to end a little bit early, giving some other people some a little bit of extra time, and I want to thank you know you for this opportunity. But once again, kind of saying the budget really needs to be um, a little more inclusive and person centered. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Robert Bounds. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I'm on, my name is David Williams. I'm speaking on behalf of Robert, but he's speaking himself through his iPad. So I want to mm -hmm. make sure I hear it. He has his thoughts on it. Thank you. It's an ongoing. Can find and keep quality. Be stabbed this in the coming years. Funding needs to be increased for agency. We need to pay them good wages, not fair wages. Good wages keep quality staff. Something like LinkedIn, but for OPWDD. With those changes, we can hope for a better future. And with staff being a staff, we put that together for them. That's basically how you feel about the whole situation. Hello? Hello? Yes. Was, did that conclude? I just yeah. didn't hear the last sentence. Oh. Hold on. I'll play it again one more time. We got we got one minute and twenty five seconds. So I'll play it again for him. Thank you. Okay. There is an ongoing staffing crisis going on in both traditional. OP needs to focus on this in the coming years. Funding needs to be increased for agencies and the self-directed budget. To pay them good wages, not fair wages. Good wages keep quality staff. In addition to that, OP should utilize technology to network quality staff for self-advocates. Something like LinkedIn, but for OPWDD. With those changes, we can hope for a better future. Thanks. Well, that's basically basically okay. um how you felt about everything. That was um his thoughts on everything. 
Thank you very much. We You're appreciate welcome. that. No problem. Thank you, Kate, and we'll move to our next speaker, David Cottrell. Good morning. Everybody hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Good morning. I am David Cottrell. I am the father of a 26-year-old uh, with autism who lives in a community home here in the Southern Tier. I also am a board member uh, for Southern Tier Connect and Springbrook, and I am a job advisor at our local BOSIS. And I work primarily with 16 to 21 year olds with developmental disabilities. In order to help families of all races, disabilities, and socioeconomic status, it is time for OPDD, as well as the other O agencies, OCFS, OMH, OAS, AS, as well as the Department of Health and the Department of Education to break down their silos and to work together to provide families with information on all available services that can help them. State agencies need to stop competing against each other and creating separate rules for people with disabilities. OPWDD, the Department of Health, Department of Education, and Office of Aging should all be working together to help a family make a life plan for their child from the beginning of school until their senior citizens with a type of collaboration would allow for transitions for these members to be more encompassing and proactive instead of reactive. To help prepare people in the community for transitions into employment and day services, we need to drastically improve our communication with clients and families at a younger age. We need to find out if a client and their family wants to work full-time, part-time, or volunteer. Next, we'll be sharing this information with our school systems to train, start training a client from age 16 and up on job skills for the full-time and part-time work, as well as volunteering. Finally, sheltered employment needs to be brought back to help clients who are not able to work the 24 to 40 hours per week. Clients should have an opportunity to help themselves and the community in other ways, which are just as important as a paying job. Also, housing supports currently take far too long to process in New York State with very little transparency on actual availability OPWDD needs to work with communities better to build more community homes and apartments for clients who may be able to live semi-independently. Communities need to learn that people with disabilities are assets to the community and are good neighbors, good employees, and consumers willing to spend money in their communities when provided with a safe home to live in. Technology and adaptive equipment are always changing and can provide many opportunities for OPWDD clients that they may not have had even a few years ago, especially given the revelations telehealth has given through the pandemic. We must continue to provide new ways to help people, including iPads, apps, programs such as Zoom and adaptive equipment to improve independence and the sense of pride and connection. Telehealth has become a wonderful way to do a first check on someone who has signs of health issues. For anyone with anxieties of going to the doctor's office, it was also a great way to build a relationship and lessen anxiety. And finally, people in the direct support, in direct support and clinical workforce are OPWDD's most valuable assets. We need to make sure staff has livable wages, benefits, continued training from experts and from families on what families need to take care of their loved ones. Stop stressing out families and care management organization by threatening cuts each year. The rate of families signing up to the CCOs grew by 10%, not the anticipated 2.5%. We need more CCMs, not less, to give every family more opportunities to put together a life plan to help provide sustainable services through a client's life. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And we'll now move to Gail Cotto. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Good probably morning. going to repeat a lot of what Jackie said. I'll probably not as eloquently, but uh, my name is Gail Pato, and I'm a parent of Tioga County, New York. I'm also both a regional family support council member as well as an appointed representative of the statewide family support council. 
Um, today, I'd like to briefly touch on three topics, including state funded services, housing, and the workforce. First and foremost, I'd be remiss if I didn't address one of New York's most valuable assets when it comes to providing care, support, and safety for people with developmental and intellectual disabilities, and that's families. Uh, families save New York State countless dollars through their dedication of maintaining the quality of life for their loved one at home with them, which is the least restrictive setting. I firmly believe that we do need to continue to strengthen the state funded services that support families to continue to support their loved ones. New York State should continue to develop and evolve a continuum of services avail available for those with differing needs in all areas. This brings me to my second topic of housing. As services continue to evolve, OPWDD's message of independence seems to be taking the lead in encouraging individuals with disabilities to live and work in their communities. However, we really need to provide additional options that not only support someone's change in health and abilities, but can go with them wherever they choose, allows access to funding that can meet their changing needs. And ideally, we should couple this type of flexibility with technology that truly gives people independence and creates efficiencies that not only allow for, but deliver quality of life. Technologies that support innovative learning, continual safety, progression of disability, and natural aging. My third point is one that's been echoed more often than any other, which is the need to strengthen the workforce and recognize the staff that dedicate their lives to helping teach and support people with disabilities as our foundation for success. If we truly want people with disabilities to learn, grow, and thrive, we need to provide them with the quality teachers equipped to prepare people for the life that they choose. The skill set needed to be a DSP is not innate in everyone. The role takes training, patience, understanding, and constant adaptation to learning and communication styles. We need to reevaluate how we value this group of professionals and find a way to pay these positions more. I realize this is outside of one time funding. However, until we address this, we can design the best programs ever, but who'll staff them and make them work? For years, I've heard low unemployment is to blame for the industry staffing crisis. And now with agencies starved for quality staff, we're seeing premium pay, incentive programs, and sign on bonuses offered everywhere to entice people to be a DSP. It's like our own little private petri dish. The applications are coming in. And I think that's proving it's not a staffing crisis, it's a salary crisis. And until we recognize the value direct support staff offer and the weight of the work they carry in this industry, agencies will continue to have to apologize to people and families because they can't fill positions. And the number of people denied access to services due to lack of capacity will grow. So if we're not willing to strengthen our foundation, we'll just continue to build on unstable ground rather than creating the world our loved ones with disabilities truly deserve. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Okay, and now we'll move to Micah Fjelka Feldman. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, um my name is my name is Micah Fjelka Feldman. I have a I like have a, a self direction plan and I have a good broker and good staff and and I think um, my staff are very helpful and I have a and I have a living care and I have people that help me with like food shopping and cooking and and I have a good broker that helps me and I have a good like living care that uh, helps me with my house things and and I have a good care manager that helps me with like things um, when I when I like I need uh, um, when I, when I like need uh, um, when I like need uh, um, uh, help with things and and my my staff are very good at, and I have a good circle that helps me in my in like when I when I like need stuff my circle is uh, there to uh, to like, to to like help me with my uh, with, with like my uh, circle and and like and like uh, support and and I um and I'm here to have a great circle that helps me in circuits and and to like when I when I like need something from my circle they are there to help me and I think the care manager role is a good role. I'm hoping that. It can get better that they can do like 
more like uh, things with me and help me with more things and and my um and 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 like the and like the thing care is a great it's it's a great matter then I can have someone that helps me pay for um pay for someone to help me um in my house and in my in my apartment and I have a paid neighbor that if I need something in in like the in like the middle of the night they can um help me and and I and I do like I do like uh, living in Syracuse, New York. I I like um lived here for nine years. I'm from Michigan, but I work and teach at Syracuse, and and I go around and speak at many many uh, conferences, and and I do a lot of stuff to help people with 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 like um with with like um, disabilities, and and I hope that people with with um, this ways can can like uh, continue to continue to uh, live in the house and live in their homes and yeah thank you thank you very much okay and we'll move to our next speaker christy nyer Hi, thank you. Um, thanks for taking the time to coordinate these multiple forums to elicit feedback from people, families, and advocates. Um, pretty much along the lines with everyone else has already said, um, family support services and self-direction are two of many programs that we as a family feel are instrumental to an individual's success and livelihood. They ensure that we are able to keep our son at home and not placed in a residential school or other type of setting. We're fairly new to these programs. The ease of utilizing these programs, however, should not be as difficult and confusing as it is for people to access funds. For example, my son is a teenager. He's diagnosed with autism and recently has exhibited more auditory sensitivity than usual. He at times walks with his head crooked and attempts to cover his ear with his shoulder and has his other hand draped over his head to cover the other ear so that he can keep a hand free. As a team, we thought some noise canceling headphones would be appropriate to try. He does have a self direction budget. However, there was some ordeal over using these funds. The organization overciding his self direction and FSS were requesting denial letters and justifications for a simple pair of headphones, all the while affecting my son's quality of life as he waits. Needless to say, I ended up paying for these out of pocket. Um, it's not to say that it's all bad, just noting that there seems to be a disconnect and confusion between self-direction and FSS. I would suggest to better address the needs of individuals and their families that these services should be individualized and not commingled into a person's self-direction budget. This is making it more difficult to access when a family needs them. Uh, these services have made a tremendous impact on our children's lives. We were blessed when family support was there to assist us through a behavioral crisis and accessing an autism specialist that was board certified to implement programs at home when there was no one else to turn to. More services surrounding autism and related disorders in our area would be extremely beneficial. We do live in the North Country up in the Adirondacks where service providers are very sparse. I would also suggest to better assist care court excuse me, care coordinating agencies to train care managers with truly understanding and comprehending these services that are available, how they work, the processes, and to be able to give guidance to individuals and families when they need them. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And we'll move to Richard Meese. My name is Rick Mythus. I am 42 years old and I live with my mom. I have had a self-direction plan for more than 20 years. I want to be sure that I have the same option for the rest of my life need to have support for 24 hours a day. 
seven days a week. Right now my staff and my mom provide that support. I want to be able to self-direct my life when my mom is no longer able to care for me. I can do this with the support of staff and my circle of support. I need to have a plan that still allows me to use my combat budget. I need time each day to ready myself for the day. Because of movement and initiation issues this takes a long time each morning. I could not imagine returning to a life without self-direction. The quality of life I am accustomed to would be devastated without self-direction. Self-direction gives me the opportunity to be a full member of my community and I do not want to lose that in my life. Thank you for this time. And thank you very much. And our next speaker is Karen Adams. Good morning, um, I'm Karen Adams. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Central New York Disability Advocacy Group. I am a member of the leadership team. We met last week and we have a few points that we would like to put forth. We're specifically talking about the American Rescue Plan. We understand that there are $700 million as part of the home and community-based services. Families would like to know where is the money going? How specifically is the money going to be spent? Who is going to report on those funds? How are the families going to receive those reports? Families would like access to the information for it to be disseminated on a regular basis and in plain language. As a parent of a, well, not young son, but 22, um, we have gone through a lot of services in our lifetime. This year has been particularly challenging. The staffing shortage has wreaked havoc on our son and our family life this past year. He resides in a beautiful IRA up in Boonville or also in the North Country. The staffing shortages has still prohibited him from returning to his day services. He has been stuck in his house since March of 2020. We um, are really asking for this to be addressed, these funds to address the crisis, crisis point for the DSPs. Any program is only as good as the staff that work within it. I cannot stress that enough. As a parent, we've seen this through schools, services, agency supports, and now in residential life. I agree with what so many have already eloquently said Jackie Sauter did a beautiful job describing how families are feeling, and we are also on board with that as part of the Central New York Disability Advocacy Group. I work at Exceptional Family Resources. I've been in this field for over 25 years. We all have to work together to do better. We can do better together. I really appreciate your time, and I'm sure you're gonna hear from another one of our colleagues. Drew Nordmark, and I appreciate everything that everyone is trying to do. But again, we have to band together and do better. Our children, our family members deserve better. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll move to Drew Nordmark. Drew, if you can unmute your mic, please. I'm trying. Yes, we can hear you. I think we may be able to hear you if you want to try again. 
I was actually intentionally remaining silent. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I did not realize my silence would cause uh, a glitch in the matrix here, but it was my intention to remain silent for 20 seconds so that you could feel what we have felt the first four months of this pandemic and the lack of communication with OPWDD. Uh, I am Drew Nordmark. As Karen said, I am also part of the leadership team for the Central New York Disabilities Advocacy Group. And one of my touch points is communication with OPWDD. And we really hope that this lack of communication ends now. Um, um, we have felt extreme uh, isolation during the beginning of the pandemic. As I, I am representing the group and also I am a parent of a 37 year old young man who lives in a group home here in Onondaga County, a wonderful group home. And uh, he has autism and Down syndrome and the lack of communication, the difficulty of families and individuals, whether their person lived in a group home or not. Before the pandemic it wasn't stellar, but during the pandemic it was became a crisis and it is our. Our hope that this ends with all of. The activity that's going on now and that. Uh, you you understand that we are just asking for guidance and answers. And I think it was Pat who mentioned, you know, we would just like a morsel of hope. And it's a painfully so slow process and we understand that. And we would like to be part of rectifying the situation. But you have to be transparent in who we can contact and how the communication continues. The other uh, topic we wanted to talk on was care coordination and care management. And uh, although my son's been blessed to have a wonderful care manager who has tried his darndest, there's no guidance or regula regulatory change that says care coordinators cannot do face-to-face -face meetings anymore. So we're wondering why OPWDD isn't encouraging this practice to resume because this is a crucial component to adequate care. And I will be running out of time, but I wanted to touch on uh, the support for rural families, I know several other parents have talked about that. They have felt especially abandoned uh, and unchampioned during this time. And I will stop because I see my time is out, but I thank you for the opportunity to voice what I was able to and we'll continue the optimism and support. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And we'll move to the next speaker, Janice Fitzgerald. I don't know if can you hear me. Can you hear me? I my my sound seems to be going on my computer. Good morning, Jan. We could um, see you. We could not hear you um, if you were speaking. Good morning, Jan. Can you um, hear us? Okay. 
what I'm going to do at this moment is we're, let's see. Good morning, Jan. If you could unmute yourself. Might be best if we move to our next speaker and then we will check um, um, back on Jan to see if she is connected. Okay. We'll move to Edward Palumbo. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank yes, you. Thank you. Okay. I am a, per I am a person with autism who lives in, in his own home. I need staff because there is no program that will fit my needs. The lack of staff for me leaves me depressed. These people are like myself with autism who have very little or no program services in my area. I need support and self-direction. There is no one wants to become a direct support staff because there is very little pay. This is wrong and people like myself with autism need help in staffing for our needs. Also, I need, I'm sorry, I also need transportation to get, to get good paying jobs <clears throat> and to become self-sufficient. There is very little transportation in my rural area and and good paying jobs are out of my area. This is also wrong because I want to become a self-sufficient human being and not and do not like handouts. If there is no transportation, I cannot get these good paying jobs. God, thank you and God for listening to me and God bless you. Sign Edward James Palumbo. Thank you very much thank you for your very comment. Much for your comment. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back and check on um, Janice Fitzgerald. If you can um, unmute. Okay, we must be having some technical difficulty. Um, we'll check back. Um, so for right now, we will move to William Ludolf. William, if you can unmute your mic, please. Good morning. Good morning. By way of background, I'm the father of a 29-year-old daughter with global delay in autism. We've been involved in self-direction for the last seven years, and by and large, are pretty happy with the whole process and how it's worked. But today I'm here to talk about the conversion of the DDP-2 to the CAS and the need for complete transparency. That is the CAS process, how the CAS scores will affect acuity level determinations and budgets. The CAS process cannot be treated as completed until there is widespread review by all stakeholders. Individuals need to be com comfortable with the CAS scoring is consistent with the DDP-2 scores and be able to see how CAS scores affect both service levels and budget levels. 
it would be important that CAS scores and TDP2 scores and budget effects are all available for view for a reasonable period of time before the DDP2 is replaced. A new CAS budget template needs to be operational for view during this period so that participants can see the impact of the CAS scores versus the DDP2 scores. So what are our CAS issues? What if the CAS assessment just isn't very good or is even worse, inaccurate? We need assurance of data and process transparencies for all stakeholders to view. We need assurance of adequate assessor training. The availability of the meaning and interpretation of questions, answers, and summaries and scores. Just as an example, currently a two-day look back may not be adequate to capture behavioral issues. How should that be addressed? We need open comparison between CAS scores and DDP2 scores. We need to understand the way CAS scores affect budgets and the way they affect the service assessment and, assess and access. We need clearly defined outline and outlined uh, due process and fair hearings mechanism for instances where there is a disagreement with the CAS assessment. Enhanced transparency would go a long way in gaining trust that the OPWDD is not just using the CAS as simply a budget cutting tool. CAS conversion should not take place until there is complete understanding of effects and widespread agreement of its accuracy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we'll move to Heather Romanek. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. And we'll move to our next speaker, Marilyn Jeffrey. Hello. Um, I'm trying to get the video going. I'm the mother of a 20 year old son with autism. He has, uh, in addition to autism, he has 
catatonia and OCD. I just want to check in and make sure you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm having a hard time getting the video going, so I'm just going to leave it the way it is. Um, Certainly. So we have been searching for future housing for my son, and it has really been daunting. He needs 24 seven support. And we've met with our broker in OPWDD about Brett's needs and wishes. We've been astonished at the lack of housing options for people who need 24 seven support. Personal budgets are not enough to cover that kind of care. And there do doesn't seem to be any options for this population. Um, as we all know, group homes have very long waits. Uh, I have met with our broker and was really disappointed at the, the waits um, and the options. If there is something available, you basically have no choice on where your child is placed, could be very, very far away. You don't, he doesn't have any choice in who he lives with, who his staff is. Um, if you get 1 to 1 support, it's for a maximum of 30 hours a week, uh, Monday through Friday and 30 hours a week. Isn't really much to build a life on. So my son at his age has grown up in a very inclusive environment. Like most kids his age, he's lived at home. He's been in inclusive schools. He's been in inclusive programs and he likes leading a life of choice. But. Now we, we run into this huge roadblock because there's no choice for housing. Um, recently, uh, myself and, and other parents have met with OPWDD about a, a new pilot program that would offer choice in residential living as well as one to one support for most of the day and then staff sharing to um, cover other hours like low need hours evening and weekend. Because the problem is that the individual budgets for our, our kids do not cover 24 seven support. And I'm an aging parent like everybody else. I don't want my son to have to live at home where he really doesn't want to be um, until I'm incapacitated or I pass away. So when we've met with OPWDD, we've been really disappointed at how they're throwing roadblocks at our, our ideas and not coming up with any options for us. Um, and I just want to touch on the idea of least restrictive. Now, one of the parents said the least restrict restrictive environment is to live at home. And I think when a child is young, that's true. But when they become mature and they want to be with their peers um, and they want choice, being at home is very restrictive. It's isolating and it's also dangerous because if, if a child grows up to be 55 years old, living with a parent who's 80 and something happens, the parent, you know, is incapacitated or dies. That child is really a danger um, until they're discovered. And then in their 50s or whatever age they are, then they get placed to somewhere in a crisis situation. None of this makes sense. There doesn't seem to be any guidance from OBWDD on what to do with our loved ones who need 24 seven support. So I'm really reaching out and asking for guidance from OPWDD and solutions because we need to have something done for this population needing 24 seven. We can't just continue as parents to hodgepodge things together. Um, there's no written guidance. I've read the, the information and the settings rule. That all seems to be based on people who were in institutions and, and taken out and put into the community, which is very noble and important. But for our kids who've never been in institutions, to expect them to live at home with aging parents doesn't work. Their choice is to live in, uh, in wherever they want to live in a way that makes sense for everybody. So that is my concern that OPWDD really has no guidance for people residential guidance for people who need 24 seven support. Thank you very much. Thank you. I very just want much. To add, in non non integrated settings, they want choice. They don't want they want to be in a non integrated setting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to do one um, quick check um, for Janice uh, Fitzgerald. Thank you. I know it looks Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, provide comments today. 
Um, I'm going to start with a reminder about what happened in 1978. OMRDD was established then as a standalone agency, and that was done for good reason. And that reason is Willowbrook. Willowbrook happened because there was a lack of money, a lack of care, and a lack of value of people with disabilities. All too often, people with disabilities are at the bottom of the service list. I hope OB OPWDD will return to being a leader and supporting people with disabilities. It hasn't felt like that. Family support is a crucial support. It's affordable and it's flexible and it helps meet the needs of the families who are supporting a person with disability. There's so many challenges families face and that family support can be um, flexible. It doesn't, what a family needs doesn't always fit into a Medicaid checkbox. The last 507 plan was developed in 2012. That's gonna be 10 years ago. I hope there's follow through on completing this plan because the lack of a 2017 plan also carries a message about value. CAS assessments. It's crucial to respect and value the person and their abilities, their responses and comments. But the input of a parent who is caught holding the responsibility and the other part of the care coordination knows the person and their needs. So their input should be also valued and considered. Self-direction is valuable, but it is eroded by cuts and restrictions. Support, um, there's a loss of flexibility. Support brokers need more training and they need more supervision. To meet the OPWDD mission, everything cannot be pigeonholed into Medicaid funding. We have to find another way to support people. Employment, we look around, employers are in crisis trying to find employees. What an opportunity for people with disabilities. Uh, there has to be um, employment and supported employment need an infusion of prioritization, communication, creativity, and energy. And that can't be accomplished if the decision making stays where it currently is within New York State. And I just really hope that there can be some creativity around employment because it would be helping the whole country if people with disabilities were respected and supported as employees. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you all very much. And at this time, I will turn the program back over to Commissioner Kastner for closing remarks. Uh, well, I want to apologize for my video moving in and out. I can assure you I was listening and taking notes, and I really appreciate all of your heartfelt uh, sentiment about our hearing today, and the lack of our plan, and the need to have a plan moving forward. Um, we are going to look very carefully at what you've said. Uh, we will try to respect and honor what you've said. We may not be able to address every concern that's been raised, but your, your input and your comments are extremely important to us. And I hope that uh, when we are able to share a draft 507 report and make our uh, planning known about the, the uh, enhanced FMAP that we can receive more feedback from you. So I want to thank you all for your participation. Um, I look forward to hearing from you in the future and, and we'll close at this point. So thanks again.